Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and welcome to a special edition of Ask an OpenShift Admin. Uh, we are joined today by the one and only Peter Lauterbach, uh, and as always, the great and, uh, you know, I can't say illustrious because that's Langdon's name, but the one and only Andrew Sullivan. <laughs> Andrew, hey. what are we talking about today, man? Peter, you're special. You get a special edition and everything. Like, mm-hmm. You know, me and Chris, it's just meh. Meh. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so thank you, Chris, and welcome, Peter. Um, so this is the Ask an OpenShift Admin Office Hour. Uh, man, that's a mouthful. I'm going to have to get used to that. Uh, so this is one of the Office Hour series shows here on OpenShift TV uh, that we stream out. And the goal here is to give you, our audience, the ability to, well, ask us anything, right? Whatever it is that's top of your mind, whether or not it's related to the topic we'll be discussing today, uh, is welcome at any point in time. And I'll try and, and remember to uh, remind you all of that periodically throughout the show. So don't hesitate to ask us questions in the chat. We'll keep an eye on those as we go through uh, and be sure to answer those to the best of our ability or drag in others kicking and screaming or not as needed to get those questions answered. Uh, so today, as Chris and I both said, uh, we are joined by Peter Lauterbach, product manager for uh, among other things, OpenShift virtualization here in uh, Red Hat. So, uh, Peter, if you don't mind giving uh, or introducing yourself, uh, as in the famous words of Arnold Schwarzenegger, I know who who are you and what do you do? Peter, you're on mute. There we go. How there you go. Working today? Like the request for song. Um, I'm one of the product managers in the cloud platforms business unit. You're really quiet, Peter. You're quiet. <laughs> okay. God, I love this technology. Give me a few seconds here. <laughs> it's a good thing everybody's not working from home with video conferencing. I, I, I am super lucky that I actually upgraded my Wi-Fi, and it was, it's way better. All right, here we go. Let's try this. Is that better now? Oh, yeah. Yeah, testing, better. testing. There we go. Yeah, my microphone has a mind of its own, too. Let's start over. Hi, this is Peter Lauterbach. <laughs> Excuse me. I'm one of the product managers in the Cloud Platforms business unit. I focus on virtualization, similar to Andrew. Uh, my original product is Red Hat Virtualization, or REV. And for the past year and change, I've been focused on OpenShift virtualization, which is uh, KVM and OpenShift. Awesome. Um, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, as Peter said, you know, one of my responsibilities, uh, official responsibilities beyond just uh, live streaming once a week is kind of OpenShift and virtualization. Uh, and that includes among other things, all of the virtualization platforms that OpenShift can run on, right? Most of you who have interacted with me know that I talk a lot about vSphere and Rev and all of that other stuff, uh, mm-hmm. but also that bleeds into OpenShift virtualization itself, uh, which is the topic of today's show. So um, in traditional Ask an OpenShift Admin or, or uh, OpenShift Admin office hours uh, fashion, I do have a couple of things that I want to cover beforehand. Uh, so. Uh, I guess what the press would call a retraction, et cetera. I don't have any retractions this week. Um, not to say I wasn't incorrect last week because that would be surprising if I got everything right. Um, just nothing that anybody pointed out to me. So I, I do appreciate it um, when you all do highlight that Andrew, you were wrong here. So that way I can correct yes. myself. So keep us honest um, by all means. Um, but that being said, there's a couple of things that have you know, come up over the last week or so that I want to bring up that I want to talk about with uh, you all, or, or at least make sure that you're aware of. Um, so I have my handy dandy sticky note here that I use to keep track of these things. Uh, so let's see, um, vSphere data store configurations. Uh, so I, I helped a customer, helped an account team because uh, essentially what happened, they deployed their vSphere cluster using, I think it was UPI. Uh, and more or less left the configuration at default. Nothing wrong with that, uh, except that they were using the default thin storage class, uh, which is pointed at the same data store that the virtual machines are deployed to and happily consuming storage, right? Provisioning all of those uh, VMDKs to act as PVC backing, so on and so forth. And the data store filled up. Oops. Uh, so yeah, this, this of course being bad, 
you know, they are thin provisioned disks, which means that when that data store runs out of capacity, basically everybody stops functioning at the same time, which is really bad. Uh, you, so you know who actually hates? Uh, do you know who hates uh, database or, or uh, storage filling up worse than virtual infra infrastructure admins? Database Databases. ones. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> database. <laughs> CBAs just don't like that. Mm -mm. Not good for your database. No, not at all. Uh, JP Data, I see your question. I'll, I'll hit that in just a second. Um, so yeah. Uh, Filling up the data store is bad. Uh, you know, my, my first reaction was to chastise them for not having appropriate monitoring in place to uh, catch and prevent such a scenario from happening. Uh, ultimately, the mitigation is to configure, right, add additional data stores to your vSphere configuration. And somewhere in my links here, I thought I had the link that I'm looking for. Um, so I will post this guy into the chat here. Uh, so it is supported to go in. You can modify the configuration. Uh, you can add additional data store definitions inside of there and then just create additional storage classes to point at those. Uh, it does become a bit of a management task right, for the application teams, for the administrator to kind of keep up with what's going on there. Um, but this is the, the perils of not having data store uh, uh, or what are they, uh, storage clusters, right? The equivalent of a DRS cluster, but for storage or for data stores in, uh, available through either the CSI paradigm, as far as I know, or the entry storage provisioner for vSphere. So uh, if anybody has any questions about that, just let me know. Um, you know, I, I, I sympathize, I understand that sometimes that can be difficult. Um, you know, VMware of course recommends using the CSI provisioner Mm. Um, you know, that gives you a lot of visibility on the vSphere or excuse me, the vCenter side as well. So that way you at least have two potential layers of, of uh, ability to see and get those alerts. Uh, the other thing, which has been a, a hot debate this morning, um, Chris, I don't know if you've seen in any of those uh, chats. Uh, feed on the streaming rig it's very it's weird yeah it's back now but continue sorry folks all right thank you uh so the other thing that i wanted to bring up just a quick recap there was re resizing control plane nodes uh so the docs and i'll paste the link here into the chat uh so the docs kind of very plainly state that you sh you can't resize control plane nodes um, essentially choose how big your cluster is going to be uh, before you deploy it and then deploy it with control plane nodes of that size. So can you resize them? And the officially documented slash supported way of doing this, uh, if you will, as soon as I can find the right window that I was looking for here to get my link, uh, is to effectively remove the control plane nodes one at a time and then reprovision them and re-add them to the cluster. Now you may be thinking, well, that's silly. Why can't I just turn it off? Why can't, you know, and adjust the CPU and memory and then turn it back on. Uh, and the reason for that is it's not tested. So therefore we don't know if there's any edge cases. We don't know if there's something that could potentially break inside of there. Whereas the whole remove and replace process is tested, right? That's kind of the mm -hmm. core disaster recovery um, piece. Okay, uh, JP Dade. Um, Saw the video on bare metal installation, creating an ISO to install the cluster. Uh, could you use the bare metal image creation to install 4.7 on vSphere? Uh, that creates static DHCP leases. Hmm. So you can use the bare metal ISO image. Um, and it's, it's as far as I know, you can. Um, yeah, because it, it used yeah, to be, I don't it was only, there's I only one ISO. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you can use the ISO to deploy onto vSphere and that includes uh, UPI, right? When you put the, um, the uh, uh, infrastructure or the platform type as vSphere, it'll automatically configure all of the appropriate things. So you don't have to use the OVA, though we do recommend it. Um, and then creating static DHCP leases. I, I believe that would work. Um, 
if you can clarify what you mean by creating the static DHCP leases, that would be helpful. Um, one thing to note, I, I think you might be referring to what we talked about last week, where if you set the DHCP lease to infinite, will it automatically mm. reserve that? Uh, so I believe that that only officially works with bare metal IPI. I haven't tested it with a bare metal UPI installation or non-integrated installation. Uh, so yes, you could use the ISO. You could do a platform equals none installation on top of vSphere, uh, but I don't know if it would work in that instance. So it, it might be worth trying. The worst that happens is it's just a bare metal install um, that you can control that way. So I, I would I would check on that. But I'll also say that doing it that way, which is effectively a bare metal UPI, you're pre-creating the VMs already. You're already you already know the IPI addresses. Um, so kind of a trade-off there. It may not be necessary. Okay, enough about uh, about the past. And the future. Uh, yeah, it's 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 the future. It, the future is here. Um, what was what's that thing? The the future is here. It's just unevenly distributed. Uh, so Peter, what? Uh, I I know we had a pre meeting on this. I know there's a lot of stuff that we want to talk about. I want to make sure that we have time to cover that. So uh, please um, tell us about OpenShift virtualization. What what is OpenShift virtualization, and uh, why why do we why are we interested? In? Why do we care? Why why would you care? Why would somebody say, hey, I think VMs in my Kubernetes cluster would be an awesome thing. That kind of question? Yeah. OK. So uh, interestingly enough, um, this actually is the main issue is, hey, I've got a traditional uh, setup, virtualization setup. I've got lots of guys that are ta uh, trained up on, say, vSphere or Rev or even OpenStack. And we've got an infrastructure that we're doing. We've gone and deployed a cloud native infrastructure. Maybe it's in a public cloud. Maybe we've got some stuff on prem. We're either doing our own thing, we're doing, uh, or we're doing OpenShift. And right now, those two worlds don't really talk to each other, right? And and in fact, the virtual infrastructure admins are like, "Yep, we provide VMs and don't care what our customers put into it." And the developers are, "Hey, we got OpenShift, and I think they're in VMs, but I don't really know." This kind of breaks the, you know, the sort of that SRE process, right? Which is the guy that actually do the infrastructure and dev all work together, right? And that's a, that's a future for a lot of people, right? There are there are some customers um, that we talk about like Lockheed that are sort of in that future today, um, but for a lot of people, it's how do I get there, right? So yeah. now I've got these. Uh, uh, go ahead. No, I was just going to say that. Uh... I've seen you do these overview presentations for OpenShift virtualization, and you've got a great set of uh, uh, charts and quotes that come from various analyst firms, et cetera, about you know how containers are what's in vogue now, and we're seeing a lot of new applications being containerized, but right. the vast majority of application logic and application data is still in virtual machines. Right, that gravitational mass. And by the way, it's not going away anytime soon, right? So mm -hmm. so virtual machines, very mature technology. There's lots of reference architectures. There's lots of automation around that that help you create those things and keep it up and running and operational, um, which is fine, right? And like you said, most people are running the business on it, whether it's a Oracle, SQL Server, something like that. Um, but the reality is, is that the that... You know that rate is flat. There's not a lot of changes there. In fact, the whole a lot of people actually work in. Oh, you know, we sort of get, uh, you know, bonused on our uptime, right? And we literally don't want anything to change here. So this idea of rapid deployment and rapid application development and sort of an agile methodology is kind of opposite of what these guys are focused on, right? But like you said, there's lots of valuable data bound up in enterprise databases and business logic that's in middleware, right? And and some of it's even on old, um, tell me what kind of language I can get away with on the call here, uh, on the stream here, right? But, you know, a crusty, a crusty Windows.NET application that was written maybe a decade ago. Um, Been in that situation. Maybe the, <laughs> yeah, and may, maybe the guy that actually wrote it is not only not working at this company, but he's actually retired because that's how old this thing is. Right. And 
and like nobody wants to touch you know they go oh we need to we need to go update this to uh you know to to handle this functionality uh, because we got some sort of regulatory requirement everybody goes yeah not it don't <laughs> <laughs> so, and it's funny, you mentioned, you know, Windows applications and especially old Windows applications, because two weeks ago, mm -hmm. Christian Hernandez was on uh, to talk about Windows containers, which really means adding Windows nodes to your OpenShift cluster and server 2019 mm -hmm. and all that other stuff. And right. essentially, if I remember correctly, OpenShift virtualization is like server 2012 R2 and, and newer virtual machines can be supported. So it's mm -hmm. one of those you know, bring them as they are, you know, all, all, uh, again, man, I'm on quotes, a quotes run today where you bring, bring your, you're sick, you're, you're tired, you're, yeah. you're hungry, you're poor. Yeah. You're hungry, something you're like poor. That. Yeah. So basically the, and let me just touch on this detail here, right? So uh, the hypervisor technology that we're basing that on, basing this on is KVM, right? Which runs across all the platforms, right? So mm -hmm. RHEL, REV, OpenStack, and now OpenShift. Right. And when we do, there's actually a certification program that Microsoft has that says, hey, if you run this, it's very similar to our RHEL certification. Right. So the hardware certification actually includes the virtualization test. Right. So so literally any platform that can run RHEL can run REV. Right. So that's that's how we get away with that. Right. And that certification for Microsoft applies not only to the current operating system that you're testing, like Windows U windows server 2019 but it applies to all valid all valid supporting operating systems that microsoft supports which takes you back to 2012 r2 um, there have been calls i've been on with customers who shall remain nameless probably for their own protection um, they say hey we got like windows server 2008 and you're kind of like mm, okay and then windows server 2003 and it's like yeah no you got to do the old yeller and take that thing out to the back and, you know, get it, get it on something slightly more modern. That's not, not such a security uh, vulnerability. <laughs> I'm, I'm not going to comment on that. So just to recap, right. From a developer, from an application perspective, right. It's, it's bringing existing applications, um, you know, within a, a reasonable lifespan forward into the Kubernetes paradigm. So, Right. I'm going to put on my administrator cap for a moment. Mm -hmm. we're, we're changing or, or we're moving from an old, you know, or, or traditional data center virtualization platform onto effectively Kubernetes, right? Mm -hmm. So what does that mean for me, right? Should I, should I be scared? Should I be alarmed? Should I, should I freak out, right? What should I, right. what do I, right? I got a whole bunch of stuff today in terms of, security monitoring op, you know day two stuff operational things that keep us in the green you know what what is on the other side right like kubernetes yeah i hear kubernetes is cool but sort of what are the facilities over there mm -hmm. that are in the platform and, and let me back up a little bit right which is and i sort of skipped over this part right which is um you know this is part of a larger modernization effort at a company right no no cloud native developer goes Oh man, you know what this, you know, 12 factor application needs is some virtual machines and that'll make it really cool. Right. It's more that, Hey, we got some valuable logic bound up in these databases in this middleware and we need to bring it along. And then back to your question of, uh, security and operational stuff, right? There's already things in the Kubernetes and, and particularly our, our, uh, our distribution of it, right. OpenShift in terms of security, right. I've got, I've got Arcos, which is an immutable OS, right? So even if somebody actually gets on your node, well, they can't do anything, right? There's SE Linux, which is baked in, right? Our RHEL is Arcos. You know, you get all that, all that protection along with that as well, right? And the other thing is that it now becomes a single platform, right? So my virtual machines are first class citizens in this new cloud native paradigm, right? So all the things that you can do with a pod and a container, you essentially can do with uh, a virtual machine, right? So it can participate, it can connect to SDNs, it can participate in service meshes, it can be part of developer pipelines, it respects all of the resourcing, um, you know, and balancing that happens in Kubernetes, which is 
fairly robust and getting more robuster as, as we do things like the descheduler. So um, the nice thing is, and, and that's the way we did it, right? It's Kubernetes first. This isn't like, hey, let's replicate everything about what we have in the virtual environment, not only the good stuff, but also kind of the crufty, weird stuff that we got and do that in Kubernetes, right? So if you think of a product like Rev, the the vert platform right knows a lot about the storage and does a lot of the storage management and the network management right it's all kind of sort of that big ball of mud as they say right yeah. and when we did kubevert and and when we came up with kubevert and and openshift virtualization we said look we're going to respect the kubernetes architecture right so a, a, everything's got to be an api and more importantly there's a very clear separation right so the virtualization piece is KVM, right? And and it does it has a lot of the capabilities that it has on the other platforms. But the storage interface and the network interface, there's a beautiful bright line of API that any pod can talk to and our VMs use as well, right? So things like cloning and replication and network management, that's literally not the VM's problem but all of the features and functionality that you have of those capabilities can be, for the most part, can be used by a virtual machine. So I've got three questions for you. Uh, so one uh -oh. is my question, one comes from Twitter and one comes from chat. So mm -hmm. I, I'm, I'm going to ask my question first. Um, okay. Or, or let me rephrase that. I'm going to ask yep. all three questions, but I think the natural order is to answer mine first and then probably uh, the one from Twitch, which is uh, Rapscallion Reeves, which what a great word, Rapscallion. Uh, and then the uh, the other one from Twitter is from Sachin. Uh, so the second I disconnect. So huh. now we're back. Are you running that on Kubernetes? You, you might need some, you might need some OpenShift <laughs> virtualization there to help you out. <laughs> Maybe. Um, right. I, sorry I about that, folks. Yeah. yeah, I see we're back. <laughs> All right. So, uh, so my question first, um, do we see any, or do you expect there to be any contention between a traditional virtualization admin and the OpenShift admin who now has VMs running in their platform? Um, so that's, Question number one. Uh, so question mm -hmm. number two. Um, so Rapscallion Reeves. Uh, so if OpenShift is running on VMs, so in other words, it's an OpenShift in overt or rev deployment, is there any mm -hmm. visibility to the undercloud of the Kubert VMs? In other words, if you create a VM in OpenShift, will it see it in over slash rev? Mm -hmm. So, and then the third one uh, from Twitter, get out of here, calendar notifications. Um, are there plans to have S2I support with virtual machines as well? S2I being source to image. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right. So let's. I'll yeah, I'll try and keep you reminded of those questions as we go through. Yeah, I know. I wrote I wrote them down here too, right? So the you're, you're smarter than me. Yeah. I. <laughs> you know, hell no, that's not true at all. <laughs> In fact, I usually find myself on a call with a customer. If you're not there, I'll go. Oh, I'm a smart guy. Let me try to answer it, and I'll I'll get halfway through my sentence, and I go, "Man, I wish Andrew was here because now I'm getting in deep in deep water." Well, thank you. Um, so the contention part is, and I'm going to divert off technology for a minute, right? Which is a lot of it has to do with how the organization is set up, right? So so if you go read the Google book, right, which I think. I've got a copy of it here, right? We just said, "Hey, we want to do SRE, right?" We you just had that handy, awesome. right? Like, I, actually, I'm, I'm I, I keep starting it, make it through it, and and I, I'm about a third of the way through, but there's it's, there's it's way great more sleeping in. material, uh, but like once you get all the equations out of it, you're good. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, but there's a lot of concepts, but yeah, you gotta you gotta wade through a lot of stuff to get the mm -hmm. nuggets. Uh, but my point is, you know, even in the conversations we we have with customers and prospects today the organization is very disparate, right? Or siloed, right? Which is, hey, we're the VM team and we're, pr and they're good at it, right? We're very good at VMs and yeah, this cloud stuff is, you know, not really known to us. And, you know, the, the dev guys are actually off subscribing to the cloud without even the IT guys knowing about it, right? Sort of that shadow IT or whatever they, you know, shadow development. But in reality, 
Kubernetes and cloud native is the future, right? So some of these guys said, look, you know, there's something cool happening over there. Let's go pay attention to it, right? So I think this is an opportunity for a VI admin to take a lot of the principles that they know today about, uh, you know, just good networking, pra you know, good practices in terms of networking and storage and, you know, data protection and apply those. The words are different when you get over to Kubernetes and some of the concepts are different, but they're still valid and valuable, right? So you can take it as an opportunity to go look. Um, and I got to tell you, actually, when I, again, a slight diversion, when I actually interviewed at Red Hat, I didn't actually have a whole lot of cloud knowledge myself. And they said, oh, you know, it's this product and I didn't know anything. And I went and Google it and I found Minishift, right? And I downloaded Minishift, put it on my Linux workstation. And I was super surprised, like how easy it was to get started, right? Which is kind of like, you know, as they say, the first hit is free. So I was hooked at that point. And so if you want to get into it and play with it, it's a good way to do it. And then the comfort of having a virtual machine of, oh, I know how to create a virtual machine. I know how to start it up. Um, and then the other thing is the web console, right? So most of the scary stuff you see around Kubernetes is all the, there's this YAML, there's this long text file that it needs to have the right stuff in it. Well, we actually have a GUI that my, that mirrors all the functions that you essentially can do in the command line and on YAML, right? So you can actually get started with um, the web console. And, and this is the thing I find very useful, right? Is I go do things in the web console and I go, and then there's a little tab that says click YAML and you go, oh, I not based on what I clicked on and what I set in the in the in the UI, I actually see how the YAML's changed and now I'm actually more comfortable with it. And now I can now I've got I've actually got a little GitHub repo that has YAML in it and sometimes I go in and edit that stuff directly. So it's actually made my made me it makes me look smarter, but it also makes it easier to digest. Yeah, it's funny you say that because I, I literally just had a conversation with somebody who was asking, is there an API for the things the GUI is doing? I think it's the other way around. The, the GUI is consuming all of those APIs. So yes, exactly. yes, there definitely is. Okay, mm -hmm. um, so thank you. Um, so I, I so think question probably, two. yeah, question two. Um, so can OpenShift virtualization uh, see, right? Is there visibility on, to mm -hmm. the undercloud for Kubert VMs? Um, and I, I think that this will tie in with, um, we should probably talk a little bit about the technology, like how it looks, how it works type of thing. Um, and I yes. think that might help answer this question. Um, and I also, I know um, Chris just pointed out to me privately that Restream isn't moving comments from YouTube to Twitch. So we both have, Chris and I both have YouTube up as well. So for anybody on YouTube, um, we are we are keeping up with what you're talking about over there. Um, okay. Trying so to I'm, at least. <laughs> yeah, trying to. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Um, so let's see. Let's click screen this Screen sharing music. With, okay, it worked just the first time. Look at that. I know. Hey. <laughs> yeah, and, and I've done this once or twice. Yeah, uh -huh. just to set this up, right? The, um, you know, OpenShift virtualization is a feature of OpenShift, right? So this isn't about, hey, can I use VMs without caring about cloud native and OpenShift, right? So you got to be in the OpenShift, you know, ballpark to be caring about OpenShift virtualization, right? And running virtual machines in there. Um, and we're currently targeting uh, on-premise bare metal deployments, right? So that's, that'll kind of, I'll turn it over to you to, to kind of then talk about sort of what the nuts and bolts look like. Yeah, I, I just wanted to do a, a quick kind of overview because I think it'll help answer some of these technical questions that I see yeah. coming up uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. To, to just do this like scratching, you know, just scratch deep of, of OpenShift virtualization. Can you increase that size a little bit yeah, font size sure. wise? Yeah, I sure can. Um, so this is, this is my lab cluster. You can see I'm running 4.7. Uh, I, I actually, uh, so... OpenShift virtualization 2.6 got pushed by two weeks. Um, so I'm running a nightly build um, in this instance, but uh, mm -hmm. 2.6 will be out shortly. Um, so effectively, like everything else, it's deployed as an operator. Let me make sure we can see all of them, right? OpenShift virtualization gets deployed. Um, when you do that, it has, as Peter mentioned, right? There's a bunch of GUI tie-ins, so on and so forth. Like you see this virtualization thing here. There's VMs down here, et cetera. And then both as an administrator, where I can go to workloads and virtualization, I can see all of my virtual machines that are running inside of here, as well as a developer, 
I can flip over to here and I can do things like, well, I want to add, let's go to the right default, right project. I want to add a virtual machine, right? And I can choose from, I can see and select from virtual machines that I want to publish. So here's a Fedora 33 templates. I want to create a virtual machine. Um, sure, Amused Herring seems like a good name for this one. Mm -hmm. Right, we'll click our button here. And just like that, we've got a virtual machine that is in the process of being provisioned. Uh, so, right. and by the by the way, the the team that works on the UI here actually has a lot of background in uh, products like Red Hat Virtualization or Rev. So we understand sort of what are the affordances and kind of what are the workflows people want to use, and applying those same concepts to Kubernetes. Yeah, yeah, and I think that's really important because it's a team that's not new to virtualization, so they understand how virtualization admins think. Um, so if I click on my VM here, right, it, kind of all the expected things, right, here's my console, so on and so forth. But Peter said, remember, it's Kubernetes native. So if I click up here in pods, you can see I've got, like, here's vert launcher for amused herring. So it's, it's literally a pod that's running inside of my environment. Uh, now, to answer your question, Rapscallion Reeves, all of this is running on physical servers. Right? It, it becomes a hypervisor. So you're deploying a virtual machine. And if I were to go to the terminal over here real quick and do like a PS-A, yes, one of these, uh, you can see here we've got a, a QMU KVM process running inside of there. So we, we, I mean, technically you can do nested virtualization, but we don't support it. Um, so really, it's not, it's not in the concept of I'm deploying a cluster, an OpenShift cluster to, in your example, say Rev. And then I'm using OpenShift virtualization to then talk to Rev to deploy virtual machines, which is what machine API does. Rather, it's creating virtual machines and deploying them in pods inside of OpenShift. So OpenShift effectively replaces the functionality of Rev at that point. Am I saying that right, Peter? Yeah, that's correct. Okay, so I, I don't know, and let me jump back and forth between things here. I lost my chat window, so I can't see the other question that we got asked. Uh, it was S2I, I think. Yeah, so yeah. I, I, I don't know about S2I. I'll, I'll have to default to um, you on that. That would be a question that if a customer asked me, I'd say, I don't know, but Andrew knows, and since you <laughs> kind of, you've kind of <laughs> knacked it as well. I'm not sure. Chris, help us out here. Um, S2I for vert, I'm not sure. I think Christian was working on that. Was he not? Or was it Trafar? I forget. I, so, you know, pipelines, Tekton, as far as mm -hmm. I know, would work as expected. S2I, I don't know, because S2I is pretty heavily dependent on basically a, a Podman build or Docker build type of mechanism. And that wouldn't really work in, in, with a VM. So the answer I think is no, but I'm not, I'm, I'm not like 70% yeah. sure of that. Yeah. Like I would say I'm 50% sure because I, I would imagine there's a way to make that work, but it would involve like deep knowledge of all the parts and pieces involved, if that makes sense. Yeah. Ooh, 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 can I ask a different, can I ask a PM stupid question? Like the, mm -hmm. and I get asked a lot of these regularly, like, hey, what about this? You know, can I do this whiz bang technology thing? Let's back up a step. What's the actual goal that I don't remember? Was that the uh, rep scallion that asked that? Oh, that was, was that different... Sachin. Okay. Yeah. So, so Sachin, maybe if you could say a little bit more about, hey, here's, here's what I'm trying to accomplish and you know, is this the right technology or may, there might actually be a different workflow uh, to actually do what you want. That's a little more, not only Kubernetes native, but you know, works well with virtual machines. All right. So we've got a bunch of questions here to, to yeah, it just flew in. Um, yeah. So, yeah. so first uh, JP Dade, it is physical to virtual conversion work with OpenShift virtualization. Yes. So, so the, <clears throat> the thing, the thing we've kind of skipped over here, right? We we've, we've been focused on, Hey, I can go create VMs natively, but like I said, there's actually uh, a whole set of 
legacy VMs, you know, the, you know, what is it? The, the 99% of the gravitational mass of IT stuff is in a virtual machine still, right? Um, and how do I get there, right? So in our traditional world, we actually have products like uh, what's called infrastructure migration services, which um, would take virtual machines from, say, like a vSphere environment into a Rev or OpenStack, right? So turn them into KVM VMs. Um, that same technology is now being recrafted in a cloud native way, right? And done by the same team, right? So under the hood, they're using, uh, I believe they use V2V, and I think there is a, P, let me double check, but I believe there is a P2V option there as well, where you can point it at a physical box and say, go figure out what that thing's doing and pull it in. Um, and, and like I said, this does two things. It does an analytics where it's, it actually can survey your entire inventory and say, I understand the different features that you have. Like maybe you're not doing anything special or weird or, you know, it's not a snowflake VM. Um, and that's green, right? So you could literally just bring that in. Um, and the nice thing is we have a warm migration from vSphere, right? Which is the VM can actually continue to run over here. We connect to the, to the vSphere APIs pull the data over and create the, you know, create the re reflection in OpenShift. And as the VM continues to run, we continue to converge and pull data until it matches. And then at a point of your uh, timing and mutual timing and convenience, you can then power down this virtual machine and power it up inside of OpenShift. I, right? I now saw literally this morning that the migration toolkit went into beta. Those guys are awesome. Yeah, mm -hmm. the, uh, it's actually based on the upstream conveyor, but you know, there's other complicate not complications, but there's other factors that take into account, like what does my networking look like? Is that transparent? Can it will it automatically fail over when I move this service from one one platform to another? Um, which is fine. The other thing that so when you say P to V though, the other thing that's super important to remember is uh, well, two things, right? One is is it a physical because I need raw horsepower, like maybe it's an Oracle database or it's an SAP thing. And the real question is, is should you be taking that into Kubernetes and putting it into a VM, right? Because if the, the la you know, if you think about your resourcing, if you've got a lot of little one U pizza boxes that, that are doing your cloud on prem and you drop a whopping, you know, SAP VM into that, just because you can, that may not make the most sense, right? If you're, if it's doing something valuable for your business, like you need to do that and connect into that thing, maybe that makes sense. But again, you gotta, just because you can, doesn't mean you should, right? All right. The so, other thing that's important, well, let me, I don't, just one I don't want to cut you this. off. Yep. Um, the other thing is, is that things that are bare metal tend to be actually really old too, right? So like when I said those Windows Server 2000, what was it? Windows Server 2003, you know, those are, I think they're process, you know, control type of things, or they're, you know, they're, they're lab machines on a, on a manufacturing floor somewhere that haven't been up to, let's see, 2003, who was president back then, right? That was, that was, that That's was true. several administ yeah, yeah that was several administrations ago, right? So, <laughs> and, you know, a lot's happened since then. And would it make sense to P to, you know, would you P to V a Windows Server 2003 R2, you know, outside of Kubernetes and put it somewhere? You really got to think about what your rationale and what your goals are uh, when you do these things. So the, the five cent version is, yes, it's there, but you might want to consider why it's still, ver still physical in 2021. Uh, right. And then, and it's exactly. going to be the same tools that exist for other KVM. So vert V2V, mm -hmm. all, that, all that stuff. Um, so next yeah, question. I would, I would imagine, and I'm sorry, just to beat on this a little bit, right? Remember when you get over to your OpenShift world, right? You still have a whole security and compliance team, right? If you look at the, you know, what did we just, uh, we just did the stack rocks acquisition and announcement, right? And ACM has a whole bunch of compliance stuff. If anybody had like, regardless of whether that technology works, if anybody has a dream that a Windows Windows Server 2003 uh, VM inside of a Kubernetes cluster is going to pass any sort of security audit, you are <laughs> you're kidding yourself. 
All right. I'm sorry. I'll, I'll stop ranting now. All right. Okay. So yes. <laughs> ne next question. Uh, also from Sachin, uh, are, is there a reference architecture for running NFV on OpenShift virtualization like is available for OpenStack today? Uh, as far as I know, no. Um, I, I, from my understanding, uh, so it's KVM underneath the covers, which means that mm -hmm. from a right. workload capability standpoint, and I know having talked with engineers and Peter, et cetera, right, they really strive for performance equivalence, right? They, they don't want there to be any degradation of performance because it's a VM running in OpenShift. So technically possible to run those virtualized, you know, network functions, uh, but we don't have a reference architecture or anything like that at this point. Um, let me see. Let's yeah, let me here. go find, I, um, in one of the blogs I had, not the, it was actually in the OpenShift 4.6, OpenShift virtualization blog that I did in 4.6, so it was, what, three months ago, probably? Let me see if I can dig it up. Um, we well, did actually, well, that com we did that comparison of, you know, hey, let's run these virtual workloads of Postgres, SQL Server, and we actually had a couple of compute ones like Black Shoals, you know, financial calculation type stuff, run them on your traditional virtualization platform, and then create that same workload on OpenShift and OpenShift virtualization. And we essentially got performance parity, right? Because KVM is KVM, right? We've been doing this for, I think it's been in the kernel, what, a decade now, right? So we know how to do virtualization. Right. And it, the, the thing about OpenShift virtualization, we're sort of changing the management control plane, right, of how you actually do these things. But the actual core piece of it is very mature and stable technology. Um, so, yeah, we had this comparison that, that showed essentially it was in a couple of percentage points of each other. So I'm, I'm going to rapid fire to answer this, some questions since we've got like 10 of them. Um, right. Go okay. ahead and finish your thought. Well, well, on the NP NPV, uh, the, the telco thing, right? So we are focused currently on sort of things like enterprise databases, um, you know, sort of your traditional IT workloads. We know uh, telcos, especially for things on the edge, you know, want to get there. Um, we're not quite there yet. So we're, we're working. We get this question pretty regularly. We'd be interested in hearing about the use cases, but right now that kind of uh you know things that demand say a low latency or you know some sort of high performance out of the vm we that's kind of a we're probably not there yet so uh Ch chaitanya i apologize i am terrible at names including and especially my children's names um so <laughs> apologies if i butcher anybody's name uh i want to do a job in kubernetes practicing basic concepts um so can I answer that one in chat? Yeah, say. I saw that there was some other chat about that. Um, off the top of my head, I would definitely recommend looking at many of the learning resources, which Red Hat has a whole bunch of them that are mm. free, right? You don't have to pay for anything. Um, my default answer is always learn.openshift.com. Yeah, uh, I just dropped resource. the link in chat. Yeah, yeah. Great, great resource to go and get started and get hands-on, you know, and with some guided scenarios and stuff like that. Uh, Conan, uh, can OpenShift virtualization orchestrate virtual machines for an OpenStack when OpenShift is hosted on OpenStack? Oof. So, no. Ooh, I'm going to have to go watch Inception again. <laughs> yeah, so, so yet, yes, but no. So this is another one of those where it gets confusing. Um, so OpenShift deployed using the IPI method to OpenStack is technically creating and destroying, right? Managing virtual machines for itself, right? Its own worker nodes using the OpenStack APIs, et cetera, machine API. If we're talking about OpenShift virtualization, then no. However, there are some weird edge cases that may or may not be supported here. So for example, it is technically possible and fully supported to deploy OpenShift to OpenStack that has a virtual control plane and physical worker nodes using Ironic. Now remember, physical servers is required for OpenShift virtualization. So in that case, you could technically deploy OpenShift virtualization inside of there and it would function exactly as you would expect. I don't know whether or not that's supported. I would be very surprised if that's a tested scenario, but yeah. it should work. In theory, um, yeah. I'm going to assume Peter's typing so that he can look that up later. Um, 
But yeah, so remember, OpenShift virtualization is hosting VMs inside of OpenShift, not OpenShift managing virtual machines and external hypervisors, uh, which is a question that we get um, yeah. frequently. So um, like, do we want to talk about nested vert and where we are along that journey? Yeah, so, and I see that there's a couple of questions um, around that. So OpenShift virtualization today requires physical servers. Um, on-premises physical servers. I'll, I'll go even further. Mm -hmm. So nested virtualization technically works. Um, you all who are seeing my screen here, this is a nested lab. Technically works, not supported. Um, great for demos, stuff like that. Yeah, great for demos, um, maybe not great for production. <laughs> yeah, it, it technically works to deploy and use the hyperscaler bare metal instances. So like you mm -hmm. can deploy to AWS i3. Technically right. works, not supported. Right, um, but th so. that's actually a road. That's actually a roadmap item for us, right? Mm -hmm. And we're being driven by demand, right? So the, again, the bulk of the stuff in public cloud is probably either AWS or Azure, and we're having, uh, you know, we're having conversations with those teams. But the thing that will actually move that along is um, customer demand, right? Because that's a, again, that's sure you could do it, but is it? You know, is it an is it actually an economic solution that'll work? That you know, that's that's one of the things that PMs care about. Like, can customers afford it? So Dan Dan asks, uh, is nested virtualization support on the roadmap? But pause before you answer that. Not looking mm -hmm. for nested VMs like what we were just talking about, but rather uh, interested in use cases where virtual machines are able to launch other virtual machines. Oh, fancy. So I would, I would uh, judging by, to, hmm. yeah, judging by your confused so, face, I would say no, run, but what's wait the, a minute. What's the actual use case, right? Yeah. Run that back again, right? Like say that question again. So they're using virtualization to deploy other virtualization or using Tecton. I, so I, I think this would be something like having that. Yeah. effectively a, a virtual control plane with physical workers. Mm. And and doing it that way, Dan. Please speak up in chat um, if we can yeah. clarify. clarify. And you're also it. anybody and everybody's welcome to reach out to me, um, Andrew Sullivan at Red Hat, if you want to ask other questions or clarify after the show ends in 11 minutes. Because um, I know we have <laughs> yeah, a hard stop actually, today. Yes, I'm not even actually seeing all of the chat here. I'm on the Twitch channel, but yeah, yeah the it's on YouTube. It's on YouTube, and the okay. the the okay. restream aggregation is being. Poor today. Okay, let's, I'll just let's, say let's that move now. on. I'll I'll figure something out. Um, yeah, Conan nested virtualization would be interesting. Doing ephemeral things that require virtualization for cloud native CI powered by OpenShift pipelines. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, again, nested so virtualization actually... in the in the sense of right deploying an OpenShift cluster that's virtual and then hosting VMs inside of there, technically possible. It doesn't invalidate the support of your cluster. It just means that doing nested virtualization isn't supported. Um, so right. uh, sorry for stepping over you, Peter. No, no, that's fine. Well, the interesting part is once you come up with a technology, people, right, OpenShift itself has a lot of future stuff that's going on. And, you know, since virtual machines are first class citizens, the very first question I get after the OpenShift guys announce something is, hey, does it work with OpenShift virtualization, right? So two examples are, compact clusters, right? Which is, it's not, it's not hyper-converged, but it's the, you know, the idea that I've got three nodes, uh, the control plane nodes and uh, customer workloads are kind of rotating all those schedulable masters or schedulable control plane nodes or what we call it, something like that. Can you use VMs there? Absolutely, right? You install the operator, you create your VMs just like you would on any OpenShift cluster. The trick there is, VMs tend to be more heavyweight in terms of resources of CPU and memory. And you just have to make sure that your three nodes are big enough to handle the control plane workload. You know, etcd can be a little cranky sometimes. Um, your actual cloud native workload, your container workloads and your virtual machines. Um, the other use case is even farther future, right? And that's a shipping product today, right? The other far future is edge. Right and sort of the single, uh, you know, single node OpenShift. Um, could you use VMs there? Yeah, probably. But again, it's you know, it's not going to run on a 16 megabyte, you know, 
ARM chip somewhere, you're probably going to need something beefy that can run VMs in it. I do see Mark Mark Schmidt is here. Hi, Mark. Um, yeah, it, Mark, saying that, that Jeff Bezos, although Jeff Bezos is now in the process of stepping down, would love mm -hmm. for there to be nested VMs and VMs in AWS because that sounds very expensive and yeah. something that he would appreciate. <laughs> So there's one other, do we, do we want to talk about futures a little bit too? Uh, it, uh, sure. Okay. So one of the other, the, one of the other things people are asking about is sort of the idea of, Hey, can I do OpenShift clusters inside of OpenShift? Right. And the idea of multi-tenant, right? So if I've got a large bare metal cluster that, you know, some of the server vendors are pushing the for you box that's maxed out with memory and CPU and possibly storage. Um, but then I actually, you know, everybody gets a cluster, kind of that Oprah thing, like, hey, Chris gets a cluster, Andrew gets a cluster, and you are actually the admin of that. So you can sort of do that today with a UPI and create VMs in the main OpenShift cluster and deploy virtual clusters inside of it, um, but it's not easy, right? So we're looking at technologies like um, HyperShift, right, which is... Mm -hmm. That's the act of taking a control plane node and running it actually in a container um, instead of a, needing a full node for it. And once we have that, that kind of technology is more mature, then it becomes much, much easier to deploy what's essentially multi-tenant. You know, you, essentially what you've got over here in your traditional IT where I can do deployments and do tenancy and separate uh, my end users and customers you'll then be able to do that inside of uh, Kubernetes and OpenShift. I did get a, uh, sorry, I, completely off subject. Somebody asked why I use Mac OS instead of Linux. It's um, a really simple answer for me. Look at all this crap I have to attach to my machine. <laughs> yeah, honestly, it's, it's a silly, stupid first world problem, right? I have right. dual 4K monitors and the screen scaling in Fedora is all or nothing. So either it's at 100%. So the 4k is super tiny and mm. I'm getting old. So my eyes aren't what they used to be. Um, or at 200%, it's the equivalent of 1080p, um, which looks right. nice and sharp on 4k, but is not this type of real estate that I want. Right. Uh, so Mac OS gives me the ability to, to do an equivalent of 1080p. So if I do a, here, I can bring up this thing and show you and then I have seen it's on this one, oh. which is looks like 2560 Whoa. by 1440. Right. Yeah. Um, so that really, that's, that's the reason why. And if you notice here, I'll switch over here. Most of the things that I do are from this bastion host, yeah. which is actually a, a, it's a Linux host. I actually, I think I said rel in the chat, but it might be uh CentOS stream. Oh, did you upgrade it? It is. Yeah. Change over. Stream. Yeah. Cool. So yeah, I, I basically do all of my real work, you know, anything Linux or anything Cento, Cento anything OpenShift related from a Linux host anyways. Um, I basically use mm -hmm. this as a browser. Yeah, I, uh, I have two Linux boxes that I use for things. One is actually a very robust server and the other is just, you know, like set up to be a desktop and it used to run uh, OBS for this channel, but uh, we've found better ways to do that um, in theory. <laughs> yeah. So uh, before we run out of time here, and I think you said we have a hard stop in about four minutes, 20 seconds. So um, say the folks on the stream here, and thank you for your questions, by the way, that actually helped shape the conversation. Um, hey, I'm interested, virtual machines in Kubernetes sounds interesting, how do I try it, right? So if you already have an OpenShift uh, subscription, or you've got access to an OpenShift cluster, you can actually just install the OpenShift virtualization operator. You just go to the, click on the little marketplace over there, the, what is it, operator hub. Mm. Download it. It's already included, the entitlement's already included. Um, you can download it, install it, and start creating VMs um, in your namespace in as little as 10 minutes. Yeah, it, um, it really is see, easy to get deployed and up and running. Yeah, um, and it's in the operator actually handles the upgrades as well. So when you go ahead and uh, upgrade your OpenShift cluster, it will say, "Oh, there's an op." It actually doesn't automatically upgrade the the open the CNV operator, but we say, 
uh, hey, there's an upgrade available. Do you want to upgrade it and click here and that'll happen? Yeah, um, yeah it, it, I, I really like the behavior of operators. Like, so for example, mm -hmm. you see that this is 2.6.0-637. This is the fourth or fifth nightly release it's updated to. I think I started at like two or 6.30, something like that. And it just mm -hmm. quietly in the background updates itself according to the nightlies, um, you know, with, without any issue. I haven't had to think about yeah. it. So it's yep. really nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the very last thought, I think, well, it won't be the last one, but there'll be other ones. Um, <laughs> the last one for this particular stream is uh, Red Hat is very strong in, in the Qvert space, right? So Qvert is our upstream. There was actually a summit about a month ago that talked about some uh, very cool things in terms of uh, handling resources. Um, the other big one that we get asked about a lot is GPU enablement, right? So I want to do either compute intensive stuff with AI ML with virtual machines and then remote uh, visualization, right? So, so those two things are actually actively being developed in Qbert right now. They are not quite downstream in OpenShift virtualization, but uh, we'll be doing some PCI path through uh, coming up very shortly. Cool. All right. So uh, I know we've got a little over two minutes left. Um, so want to make sure that everybody has an opportunity to ask any last questions that they've got. You are also welcome to reach out to me at any time during the stream or not uh, to ask questions on any topic. Uh, Andrew.Sullivan at redhat.com or on Twitter at practical Andrew. Um, Peter, I will leave it to you to how much of your uh, contact information to disclose and whether or not you, you want to uh, subject yourself to that. Uh, yeah, no, that, that's fine. I'm actually on Twitter. I think it's uh, PC, Lo uh, PC Lauterback is my handle. Um, my Red Hat email is not as um, fancy as yours. It's just P-E-L-A-U-T-E-R uh, at redhat.com. Didn't get the... Yeah, I never got an email. Don't ask yeah. me why. You got to put in a, a help <laughs> yeah, ticket. Got a ticket, they'll, man. They'll, yeah, they'll, they'll add, yeah. I think, two or three aliases. So Okay. Yeah, and I am uh, at Chris Short on Twitter and C Short at RedHat.com. If you have any questions, just like Andrew, I can get them routed in the right direction if I can't answer them at all. Yep. And so Shyam, Shyam, uh, can you list the applications that we can do with Kubernetes? Um, so no, but we can describe kind of a general category of applications. Uh, so what do I mean by that? So Kubernetes is designed to schedule and control containers. And it doesn't really matter what's in those containers. It could be a simple bash script that reaches out and pings your gateway to make sure that it's, you still have connectivity or something like that. Or it could be anything up to and including like Microsoft SQL Server. Um, so there's a huge broad range of applications out there that can all be hosted in Kubernetes. Um, really the only prerequisite is it has to be in a container. Um, and no mm -hmm. longer even a Linux container, right? With 4.7, we can now do Windows containers as well. So yeah, we got to jump. Uh, thanks everybody for joining today. Thank you, Peter, for coming on and talking with us thanks about all me. things virtualization. And Andrew, great job as always. Uh, I'm sure there are questions we did not answer. So please feel free to reach out to any of us and we can get them answered. And uh, coming up next in literally seconds, we will be talking about, uh, if I can find which sliver in my calendar this is, um, it's going to be a fireside chat with my friends at Percona, the database folks. So please stick oh. around for that. That's, they're awesome. Yeah, they're great. And without further ado, uh, stay safe out there, everybody, and uh, see you soon.